Hello and welcome to this video series on quantum mechanics. So I hope I can help you guys understand a little bit more about quantum mechanics. So please follow this video series and uh, if you have any questions leave it in the comment section and I'll try to answer them. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to start off with a general introduction to the subject of quantum mechanics and we'll be looking at specific applications to chemistry. So I'll warn you that quantum mechanics does require a fair bit of math. You should have some sort of understanding on differential equations, linear algebra, um, and perhaps even a little bit extra math would help too if you've done something in multivariable calculus. But don't worry, uh, if there is any math that will come about that is hard, um, that is, you know, that's not basic math, I will go over it and I'll try to make things clear. So hopefully the math won't be the issue here. The issue will be trying to understand the concepts of quantum mechanics. I think that's a little bit harder than the math that's involved. So without any further ado, let's, let's start the topic. So the first thing that comes to your mind is why do we need quantum mechanics? So what was wrong with whatever system we had before quantum mechanics? So it turns out that before quantum mechanics, we had something called classical mechanics, and we still have it right now. It turns out that classical mechanics is very good at describing things that are on our scale of things. So you throw a ball, okay, so you, let's say you're standing at some height h, and you're standing on a hill, or sorry, let's say you're standing on a building, and let's say you throw a ball from this building. You throw a ball from this building and intuitively you know that it's going to land somewhere over here on the ground. So this is the ground and you know that. You know it will land here and you can predict exactly where it will land based on some initial conditions. So those initial conditions might be, you know, the velocity that you throw it at or the angle you throw it at, this, this angle over here, theta. So if we know these initial conditions, then basically we can find out everything about the system, everything we need to know about the system with about 100% certainty, okay? I mean, you know, if you have a friend and you are playing catch with a ball, you throw the ball to your friend, and if your friend catches it, you know that it's going to be in their hand, right? You, you're 100% certain of that. So classical mechanics is very, very um, concerned about particles and waves. And classical mechanics does a pretty good job at describing um, the behavior of particles at a larger scale. The example I gave with your friend and, you know, the throwing ball example, and I said that it would land in your friend's hand and that there's 100% certainty that if it does land in its hand, you will find it in the hand. It might seem trivial. You might think that, well, that's pretty obvious. Why is this guy mentioning this? Um, and it'll, it'll, it'll hopefully fit into my discussion when we start talking about electrons and subatomic particles. Then you'll understand why I gave this specific example. So coming back, classical mechanics is very good in the sense that if you know the position of the particle and you know the momentum of the particle, then you can describe the system with 100% certainty. Okay, so what that means is that given the position and the velocity times the mass, because momentum is equal to mass times velocity, if you know these two variables, then you can say that I can describe this system fully. Okay, um, so it turns out that, um, Yes, so you can describe the system fully with these two variables, um, but also you need a set of constants, okay? So with the help of two variables, x and p, and with the help of some set of constants like mass, gravitational constant, um, I don't know, uh, you know, the spring constant k and etc. so on. If you're given these constants and you know the position and the momentum, you can describe a classical system with 100% certainty. So we'll see why that doesn't apply to quantum mechanics, okay? In the quantum world, um, things aren't like this. So let's start off with some discussions 
um, that led to quantum mechanics. So basically, it all started with a debate, okay? And the debate was on the nature of light. So specifically, the debate focused on the physical nature of light, okay? So is light a particle or is light a wave? So there were many experiments that, that suggested that light was a particle. Other experiments suggested that light was a wave. So you can see that it's very confusing that, you know, you do an experiment once and it turns out, okay, that light behaves like a particle. Then someone else does another experiment that's similar and it turns out light behaves like a wave. So it was very perplexing to scientists, very confusing to scientists that what is the true nature of light, okay? So people like Newton thought that light was a particle and Newton thought light was a particle because if you, if you shine light on a prism, it turns out that light splits into its seven colors that we described by Vib Goyer, violet, indigo, blue, and so on. So Newton thought that, you know, light was made up of particles and the prism sorts these particles based on wavelengths and that's why we see colors. That was Newton's logic. Other scientists thought that light was a wave be because of certain experiments they did. Um, and I would say that one of the most famous persons was Maxwell. He came up with his electromagnetic theory um, and he came up with a set of equations that basically pointed towards the fact that light is a wave, okay? So before Maxwell, people took Newton's word because he was a very smart guy. But when Maxwell came with his theory, um, then then it, it casts doubt onto the nature of light. Then, then people were like, nope, light is a wave, it's not a particle. But lo and behold, the debate didn't settle over there, okay? The debate still continued because of other experiments which, which gave rather confusing results. So we're going to start off with one of those experiments, and hopefully this experiment lays the foundation for our discussion of quantum mechanics. And the and the experiment I'm going to discuss is Young's double slit experiment, okay? So I chose this specific experiment because it's going to help us it's going to help us define a particle and define a wave, okay? And then based on those definitions, we're going to correlate it to light and then we'll see what's the nature of light. So, here's, here's how the experiment goes, okay? So the experiment is that you have some sort of slit, and by slit I mean a hole that's, that's, um, that's on a surface. It's a hole that you put, and through that hole you can send you know, light, you can send particles through that hole, whatever you want. And then on the other side of the slit, you have some, you have some um, detection device. Okay, and that detection device is going to detect every time a particle or a wave lands there. It can do so by changing colors, it can do so by, you know, just having a pattern on it. So somehow that detection device is going to measure, you know, particles and waves coming onto the screen over here. So it turns out that when we send a particle through here, the pattern formed on the detection screen is different. When we send light through the slit, then the pattern formed on the detection device is also different. So basically the idea here is that, um, you know, if you, if you can identify the pattern that particles make on the detection screen, and you can identify the pattern that waves make on the detection screen, then basically you can send anything through that slit and then you can see what kind of pattern it makes on the screen and then you can relate it to the pattern made by particles or waves and then you can decide and then or you can figure out exactly um, what the nature of the thing was that you sent through the slit whether it was a particle or a wave. So first things first let's kind of let's kind of discuss what a wave is and what a particle is. So a particle is something that we, we all know what it is. A book is a particle, a golf ball is a particle, you're a particle. Particles are localized in space, okay? What that means is they are defined very well in space. 
If you have a golf ball, you know where the golf ball starts, you know where the golf ball ends, you can hold it in your hand, um, and it, it is very well defined. Waves, on the other hand, are delocalized. So they're, they're very spread out, um, if you guys remember, or if you've taken some, some math courses, then you could think of a sine or a cos wave, okay? So the wave's position is very, very uncertain. You don't know, you know, where the wave is. So that's, that's what I mean by delocalized. It's spread out in space, and it doesn't make sense to classify the wave based on its distance. Um, there's something else that we use to classify a wave, and that's called the um, wavelength. But anyways, the point of this discussion is that what happens when I send particles through the slit? What happens when I send um, waves through the slit? Okay, so, so we assume that if we have one slit and we send a particle, so for example, let's say you're standing on the other side of this slit and you start throwing balls. You start throwing balls, let's say you start throwing tennis balls. So... It turns out that, you know, sometimes the ball you throw will land right at the center. Sometimes you'll throw the ball and because you don't have the best aim in the world, the ball might go somewhere on the periphery or the edge. Other times it might go along this direction. So it turns out that the pattern you're going to see on the screen is something like this. Okay? So it means that in this edge, the probability of finding the ball is very low and if you if you get towards the center then you're more likely to find the ball there right so we can say that this is the intensity graph of the ball or the particle the intensity graph looks something like this if we send particles um, through a single slit and I know I called it the double slit experiment, um, but I, st I want to start off with a simple case by looking at one slit, and then we'll go on about looking at two slits. So similarly, now, if I have one slit and I have some sort of selection device, or I mean um, detection device on the other side, now what happens if I send waves? So waves look something like this. Um, and how you can do this is uh, you, can, you can have a water, you can have a big bath of water, and you can place slits over in, into the water vertically, and then you can put your finger in and out of the water, and you can create waves, and then these waves will propagate through the slit, and then they'll end up onto the other side, um, onto the detector. So it turns out that the pattern for waves in a single split it is it is very it is very dissimilar to a particle. It looks something like this. So instead of the previous case in a particle, we saw that there was one peak, and that was the place where you would find the most amount of particles. In waves, you get this squiggly kind of pattern, right? So there's, there's, a, there's some sort of maximum here, there's some sort of minimum over here, there's some maximum here, there's a very big maximum over here, and so on. So why do we see this pattern? Why isn't it like particles? Why do we have this kind of weird pattern being formed? And the reason for that is because waves interfere with each other, okay? So you should know that waves can interfere with each other constructively which means that they add up, the net result is adding. For example, if the waves are in phase, that means their, their crest and their troughs align. So the crest and the trough are basically fancy ways of describing um, the maxima and the minima. So if you add up these waves and they're in phase, then it turns out that you're going to get a bigger wave as a net result. However, now let's assume that you have waves that are not in phase, okay? So one of these waves is like this and the other wave is like this, okay? So there's some sort of um, phase difference between these two waves. As you can see, this is a minima here, but on the other, on the other wave, 
um, you have a maxima. Similarly here we have a maxima but on the other side we have a minima. So it turns out that this is called destructive interference that the waves will cancel out and you you might you just you get like you probably will get something like this like the waves cancel out their amplitudes cancel out so you basically get a destructive effect okay so basically when there's a destructive effect we see minimas and where there is a constructive effect we see these maximas okay so it might not, you might think that how is one wave interfering with itself, right? It's like there's only one wave, so how is it interfering with itself? Well, you kind of think of it like this. So um, the scientist who explained this single slit pattern for waves was this very smart guy named Hugens. And he said that think of the fact that every part on the wave is capable of forming more waves okay so when when this wave propagates through this slit then you say that there are many waves that are coming out because of the different um, points on that wave each point on the wave is capable of generating different more waves okay so then you would get some sort of pattern like this so then you would see that points like this there's destruction there's a destructive effect um, and in other points like this there's a constructive effect so basically when there's a constructive effect you see a maxima where there's a destructive effect you see a minima um, so this is not to scale but hopefully you get the idea all right so with this i'm going to leave this video for you for you guys to kind of start thinking about the different patterns that waves form and the different patterns that particles form. And in the next video, we'll start, discuss we'll start discussing the double slit experiment.